What is going on guys? Hope you're all doing awesome and welcome back to another Kaggle video. In this one, we're taking a look at this competition, which is diabetic retinopathy detection, identify signs of diabetic retinopathy in eye images. So it's uh, image classification and we're um, asked to detect basically given these kinds of images, we're asked to detect if diabetic retinopathy is prevalent in the image or not. Uh, and, uh, you know, this competition is from six years ago, and there's a prize money amount of $100,000, which is a quite large amount. And I think we can learn a lot from this competition. So let me first talk a little bit about how I'm going to structure this video. Uh, so my idea is to first sort of um, give a brief introduction uh, of the of this disease, or actually, it, well, it's a complication of having diabetes. But we'll try to understand uh, this diabetic retinopathy. And perhaps most importantly, uh, we're going to try to understand, you know, how do we actually see, the, uh, see this in the, uh, in the images, in the training data. Because I think a, uh, an important part is getting to know your data uh, and try to understand the difficulty of the problem. Then I want to um, start with a, um, well, first of all, so what I want is to get a top 1% solution. That is sort of my, uh, sort of when I think about what I want to uh, do of the, on these old competitions is try to accomplish having a top 1% solution. After that, so, you know, I think you can continue to improve your solution infinitely, right? It, there's no stopping point. Uh, but what I feel is giving the most is give, getting a solution that performs in the top 1% and then that's it. And then continue to another competition. So what we'll do is we'll create a baseline, a uh, very simple baseline, so we get something to work. And then we'll iterate on that baseline with ideas of, of how we can improve it. Uh, and when we reach a top 1% solution, we're finished. And I might have some ideas um, of how you can continue to improve. Um, and so I'll, I'll discuss those at the end. And if you want, you can take those and try to experiment and see if you can come up with something better. But that's sort of the expectation you can have from this video. So let's now try to understand, first of all, what the problem is and, yeah, basically, how does this diabetic retinopathy form and, you know, what is it, how do we detect it, and so on. All right, so it's called diabetic retinopathy. And let's try to understand, you know, why this is important. So Diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in the working age population of the developed world. It is estimated to affect over 93 million people. Uh, so that's a description that they give from Kaggle. And it affects about 40 to 45% of people with diabetes, which is, you know, that's a large amount of people. And uh, one other thing is that it can be slowed if the, if the diabetic retinopathy is detected in time. But... Um, the, the sort of difficulty is that it shows very few symptoms until it's uh, sort of too late to actually um, s slow it down or avert it um, entirely. So having more automatic detection systems could be very helpful because then we could um, basically check more people if they have diabetic retinopathy. All right, so before I get into explaining uh, what causes or what the sort of diabetic retinopathy is actually about. Um, I want to first say that I'm no expert at this at all. So yeah, be skeptic of everything I'm about to say. And uh, you know, if if you're knowledgeable knowledgeable about this, and I'm I'm saying something wrong, then please leave a comment, and we can learn from it. But I think this is going to give you an idea uh, and an overview of the problem, nonetheless. So one main characteristic of having diabetes is having high blood. Uh, glucose levels, or also called hyperglycemia. Now, having hyperglycemia um, actually damages cells in the eye, in the retina of the eye, called retinal parasites. Not So when I first read about this, I thought it was parasite, but it's pericite, P-E-R-I site. So those are just particular cells in the retina of the eye. So what these cells do is that they control the blood flow uh, in the eye. So what happens is that you have these blood vessels and around them um, kind of looks like patches around these blood vessels. 
you have these um, these parasites. So uh, when you have an increase in blood sugar levels, um, you basically lose these parasites. Now, uh, here comes some my theory. This is not what I, what probably happens. This is just my theory. But what what I believe happens is that when you have an increase in uh, glucose inside this vessel, uh, I think, so basically my theory is that through osmosis, there's going to be a pressure for, for the levels to even out from inside the blood vessels and outside the blood vessel. And so what um, my theory is that it causes pressure and basically that these, um, through this pressure that these parasites are, uh, are sort of lost, um, uh, that are formed around this blood vessels. Anyways, that's probably completely wrong. But either way, the conclusion is that we lose these parasites around. And what causes and what sort of the result is, is that you have these um, basically leaky vessels around the vessels. And what happens then is that um, you can have these micro aneurysms. So basically you have blood leakage from this vessel. And this is something that is uh, some, something that we can observe in this microscopic eye exams. So, so how we can detect these uh, micro aneurysms is, uh, is from seeing red dots on these eye images. So you can see basically, um, so this is an image I believe we can see it on. I'm not exactly sure, but you can see these red dots here, 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 here. You know, there's a lot of red dots here. Uh, and I, I believe that these are examples of, of these micro aneurysms. So another uh, complication is that when you have these leaky vessels, you also have leakage of other things than, than blood. You also have leakage of uh, proteins and lipids. And this is also something that we can detect uh, on these microscopic eye exams. So what that looks like is you can see these yellow flakes in the image. So here there, you can see them quite well. Uh, here you can also see them right here. And then on the the most to the right, you can see these that you know the very prevalent example. This is one of the more um, extreme cases. Another thing you can also see on these eye images is that because of a lack of oxygen, where I'm not exactly sure of the cause, but because of a lack of oxygen, the eye also tries to uh, increase the the number of blood vessels uh, in the eye. So on the left here, you can see a healthy example. You can see the blood vessels right here. Uh, on the right, you can see uh, the blood vessels. But then in the background, you can see this increased amount of blood vessels. And you can kind of see that there's a lot of them. There's a, a many, many blood vessels here. Um, and that is another uh, thing that you're able to see. So sort of in conclusion, right, in summary, you can see red dots because of microaneurysms. You can see yellow flakes, which is from uh, lipids and proteins and other things leaking from the blood vessels. And unfortunately, because there's no way for them to get back, after they leak from the vessels, they are sort of stuck in the eye. Um, so it's, yeah, pretty horrible. And then uh, the last is that you can see an increase in blood vessels. So if you were to try to sort of learn how to find and classify these images, uh, this is what I would look for. And just one thing, uh, that you know we can see just from this overview is that it, it can be quite difficult to see and then a conclusion is that we might have to you know have very very high resolution images so that that's the overview uh, of the problem let's now try to take a deeper look at the data and then we can start uh, with a baseline solution so for the data, first of all, we have five classes uh, where zero is no diabetic retinopathy, one is mild, two is moderate, three is severe, and four is proliferate, proliferative uh, DR. So if we uh, check on the images, we can see right here that these are how the images look like. So maybe we can make them larger. Uh, and uh, let's see, so we can take a look at this one. And yeah, so this is one example. Yeah, so one thing you can see is that if we, for example, just compare these two images, right? You can see that there's a big difference in the images and how they're actually look like. This one looks like it's uh, cropped perhaps much better. 
this one has a lot of black uh, you know in relation to the entire image this takes up a much smaller proportion so this is also something that they mentioned in the Kaggle description that these images are taken with a varying degree of equipment and so the images look very different and uh, we'll get into that more later on but this is just something to keep in mind that um, we might have to do some pre-processing to get these images uh, in a better format. Um, but yeah, so that is how the images look like. And what I've created is basically, I took these train labels and they, uh, they were sorted already. So I just copied, I don't know how many, I think 4,000 to a validation data. Um, and then I copied uh, or then I left the rest to be the train set. So we have 32,000 uh, examples on the training set, and then we have 4,000 on the validation. So, so that is how I sort of split it. I just created another CSV file. And what I also did is that I ran a um, an image resizing script to resize them to a little bit smaller images to uh, 650 by 650 because these original ones, they're actually really high definition. So high resolution, they're actually 2,600 by 2,000. Uh, and so if we just load them, you know, it's gonna take a really long time. Yeah, so that's just one thing I did. I think this is not very difficult. So I'm not gonna show exactly how to do that, but that is this sort of baseline. And what we wanna do now is create our first baseline solution. What I recommend here is to have something that is incredibly simple, all right? Uh, the simpler, the better, and, and, and most importantly, it needs to be quick to iterate. So before we get started on the solution, I would be very interested to hear what your thoughts are and what ideas you have on what would potentially be a very good solution to this problem. Uh, basically, what are the steps you would do um, and yeah, share them in the comment section below because I, I would be very curious. For our baseline solution, I'm going to have a config file where we're going to specify all the hyperparameters of the model. Uh, then we're going to have a utils file for, you know, loading the model and so on, maybe creating a submission file as well. Then we're going to have a train file to, to train our model and then a data set file to, to load the data. All right, so starting with the config file, we're going to have a few imports and we're going to use albumentations for data augmentation. Uh, then we're just going to specify our hyperparameters. And so these are, these are you know, pretty standard. Uh, device, learning rate, weight decay, batch size, number of workers, um, and the checkpoint file, where, you know, the file that we're going to save the model as. In this case, I'm naming it B3. So we're going to use efficient at B3 uh, on 120, 120 image resolutions. So the data augmentations are going to be first a resize to 150, 150 random crop of 120 by 120, and then we're gonna normalize with the mean and standard deviation uh, that I calculated from the entire training set. Uh, I've made another video on this if you'd like to check it out. And then on the validation transforms, we're just going to resize it directly to 120 by 120. Uh, so one thing you can notice here is that I'm, this is a very, very simple uh, right baseline in that we're only resizing a random crop. There's no, color jitter, there's no horizontal, vertical, flip, rotation, etc. And that is because I want to first create the most simple solution and then we can expand on that idea. So for loading the actual data, we are going to have a few imports, first of all, and then we're gonna have we're gonna call it DR dataset. First we're gonna send in you know the images folder, the path to the CSV file which contains the image file and the uh, the label and that we looked at previously. We're also sending in train equals true, basically to, to have it work for both the training and the test set, and then transformations. So yeah, we're reading the data to self.data and then image folder. Um, we're gonna find the image file with os.list directory and then yeah, self.train equals train. Length, we're just gonna um, return the length of the data set depending on if it's uh, the training data or if the, if it's the test data. So test data doesn't have a CSV file. So we're just gonna low, we're just gonna return the length of the image files in total. For the get item, um, we're just gonna locate the image file and the label from the 
from the CSV file if it's self.train. Otherwise, uh, we need to um, do some modifications to it. And then we read it with, with pill image.open and then we convert it to a NumPy array because we're going to use albumentation. So we send it through the augmentation and then we return the image, the label and the image file. The image file is important when we're actually creating the test data uh, so that we, you know, for our submission file. So that's the reason why we're returning it. Then a good sort of sanity check is to just see if it actually works. So we send in the images folder, the path to the CSV, we create our loader and then we iterate um, through our loader. So if we just run the script now, we can see that the shapes should be okay. Maybe we can have a sys.exit after right there. Uh, now we can see that we have a batch size of 32, 3, 120, 120, and then labels is just 32. And so this seems to be working, just a quick sanity check. Let's now move on to the utils file. So similar thing here, we're gonna have a few imports. For the first function that we're gonna create is the make prediction function. One thing I realized that I actually missed in my overview of this, which is very important, is the actual, uh, the, the, basically the scoring function, which is quite unusual or the metric used. Uh, it's a quadratic weighted kappa. Uh, really, I don't wanna go in depth on it because I could make an entire separate video on just that specific metric. But it's basically a consensus uh, metric between the labelers and the actual predictions of our algorithm. And um, so the most important thing to know is that if it's, um, if it's further away from the actual label, it gets uh, penalized quadratically. So let's just say that the label is four and it predicted uh, two, predicted two, then that is uh, two times as worse than predicting three, right? So as far, you know, the distance of where it is um, basically increases the, the, the loss or sort of the metric of this quad quadratically. We want to ensure that if it's wrong, then at least it's, it tries to be close to the actual label. All right, so now that we have an intuition of the metric used, uh, let's continue with our make prediction file. So we have predictions and we have file names. Um, we're gonna iterate through the loader and we're gonna uh, basically run it through and then we're gonna take uh, just the run it through uh, model and then take the argmax. So for our first submission, we're just gonna use cross entropy loss. But as I explained the, uh, the distance of the label and the prediction um, is very important because the fact that the metric causes the distance to be to be uh, quadratic, uh, we want to ensure that the distance is as small as possible. So having a cross entropy loss is probably not the best choice because of the reason that it doesn't the, the distance is not covered in that loss function. But as I said in the beginning, we want to have something that is simple and just. Yeah, j just as simple as possible, and then cross entropy loss is is, um, is good enough. So that's the reason why we're taking an argmax, uh, and you know, as I said, also we'll we'll iterate on this idea. So this is not the final final version. Then we're just creating that to NumPy, and we're uh, concatenating the files. Lastly, we're creating a data frame with image and level, and then we're outputting that CSV. We're toggling back the model train, putting done with predictions, and that's it. For the next function, we're doing a check accuracy, set model.eval, then we'll have all predictions and all labels, and then we'll have number correct, number of samples. So uh, as I said, we're not actually, uh, the, the accuracy is not very important, right? Because the, the metric we're trying to optimize for is quadratic weighted kappa. But what I'm going to do here is I'm gonna uh, get all the predictions and all the labels, and then we'll use sklearn uh, function to also calculate the, um, the the quadratic weighted kappa score. So we're iterating through the loader. Uh, we're getting our scores. We're doing getting our predictions by doing argmax, number of correct number of samples. Um, but as I said, the, the accuracy is not important. So the important part is this, where we're adding the predictions and the labels, and then we're printing the accuracy. Uh, but we're importing, uh, we're returning the concatenation of all the predictions and all the labels. And this is then going to be sent into the sklearn um, function 
which we're going to see in the train file. All right, next function is just a save checkpoint. Um, and I have separate videos on this also. But so save checkpoint and then load checkpoint. One thing I've noticed is that if you're loading the checkpoint, uh, it's very important to also change the pr pr the learning rate of the optimizer because if you don't, it's going to be loaded with the saved learning rate of the op optimizer. So yeah, just, just one thing to keep in mind. And that is it for the utils file. Let's now create the, uh, the training file. All right, so in the train file, we're actually gonna put everything together and create you know the training of the model and so on. So we're gonna have a few imports. Uh, and one important here is the from sklearn metrics, Cohen Kappa score. Uh, and then we're gonna use efficient net uh, from efficient net PyTorch. And then, uh, which you can just do by pip install efficient net PyTorch, I believe. And then from dataset import dr dataset from TorchVision save image. Uh, just I'm don't so this is important to just save a couple of examples to make sure that they look okay, so nothing is wrong in the pre-processing steps. From utils load check accuracy make prediction, and then we're gonna create a train one epoch where we send in all the necessary parts. Uh, we're gonna iterate through a loop with tqdm of loader. I've made a video on that as well, on how you can get a, a uh, progress bar using TQDM. Uh, and then if you would like, you can save image to make sure that they look okay. And this comment looks weird, but yeah. So we're gonna uh, get the data to CUDA, right, to the device. And we're gonna do the forward step. We're doing that with float 16, mixed precision, with torch CUDA amp autocast. Made a video on that as well, if you're confused over that. Uh, in the backward step, we're doing optimizer zero grad, scalar scale loss, and then, uh, you know, yeah, this is basic stuff. In the main file, we're creating a training data set using that DR data set that we uh, created. We're using train transforms for that. And then we have a validation data, same uh, image directory, but with val labels instead. The test data set, yeah, same thing, except now we send in a test um, we send in an arbitrary CSV because we're not using the CSV. This could definitely be improved. But then we're using the val transform and train equals false. Uh, creating the loaders with the batch sizes uh, and so on created in the config file. For the test load, I'm just setting numworkers to two. Um, and yeah, that is it. For the And then the val loader, same thing. Loss function, we're using cross entropy. We're creating from pre-trained efficient at B3. We're changing the last linear layer of the efficient net though, because we don't want a thousand classes like an image net. We just want five. And then we're getting that to CUDA. So to the GPU, create the optimizer, Atom. So standard stuff really. Uh, we're creating the scaler. And then we're uh, basically having, uh, if we want to load a model, we're using the load checkpoint file from the utils file. Then for epoch in range of the number of epochs we specified, we're going to train one epoch. And we're gonna get uh, our score on the validation data. So we're running check accuracy where we're getting the accuracy, but most importantly, we're getting out the predictions and the labels, which we can then uh, use to compute the Cohen Kappa score where we send in the weights to be quadratic. Then also we want to, if we want to save the model, we're saving it every epoch. So we're creating a checkpoint with the model and the optimizer um, state, and then we're calling our save checkpoint. Uh, then at the end, we're doing a make prediction to get a submission file uh, from the test loader. And then if name equals main, we're running the main file. All right, so actually I'm gonna change a few things in the config file, uh, just so that we can perhaps make it a little bit faster to train. Let's set the batch size to 64, so just pretty standard. And uh, let's now run the train file. Okay, so now it has been training for a while, maybe 20 minutes or so. And I'm going to stop it here because in the last three epochs, it hasn't improved really. Uh, it went from, let's see, 0 0.4, 0 0.49, 0.52, 0.55. And then in the last three epochs, it's been 0 0.55. So that is our baseline. Uh, and I also like to write these things up. So, um, yeah, so this one, 
our baseline, B3 with 120, 120 image resolution. Our validation score was 0. Point, yeah, 0. 0.55. And we are going to compare to our validation score. Uh, you could create a submission file and then compare to the, to, you know, basically the public leaderboard. But it's just going to take unnecessary time, I feel like. So we're just going to compare to our validation score. But what I want to do is actually create our prediction uh, one time just to ensure that it works. Uh, so we're going to load our model and then we're going to uh, make a prediction and then we're going to see it, sh it should perform over uh, 0.5. And if it doesn't, there's something wrong with our uh, with how we're computing uh, the submission file or something like that. So I'm going to run this. Uh, we're going to get our submission file. We're going to ensure that we get 0.5. And then let's discuss what our ideas are to improve this, this score. All right, so I'm just going to drag this submission file over and we'll see what we get. And yeah, I expect to get over 0.5. All right, and we get 0.526. So that is our baseline. Uh, we can also write that up. So what we can see is that it's quite similar on the validation and the public score. But uh, moving forward, I'm just going to use the compared to the validation score. All right, so what are our ideas on how to improve this? So my first idea is to pre-process uh, the images. So to pre-process them, what I mean by that is that if we take a look at the images, then we can see that they look quite different uh, because in the description, they also uh, mentioned that they use quite varying uh, equipment and cameras and so on to take these. But you, you, you know, if you just compare these two right here, then you can see that this one takes a larger proportion than this one. So my idea is that if we could pre-process the images in some way, such that we can, uh, in this case, you know, remove uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the black sort of background and make sure that this takes up uh, the, the larger uh, sort of proportion uh, of the image, and then ensure also that the aspect ratio are the same now we've just resized them. Um, so that is the first idea that I have. And let's, uh, yeah, let's see how we do that. All right, so as usual, we have a few, yeah. So first, you know, it, it tries to remove the unnecessary black borders around the images. And so we trim the images to take up the entirety of the image. And this, this file, this solution that I did here, it's hacky and it's not very nice and I'm kind of embarrassed to show it, but yeah. So uh, we have a few imports and uh, to do this fast, we're going to use multiprocessing. Um, and yeah, it's quite important so that we don't have to wait forever. We're still gonna have to wait quite a long time though. So we have a function called trim that takes in an image and it converts. So what we do here, we convert the image to grayscale using CV2 then we compute a binary matrix of the pixels that are above a certain threshold. Um, and then we take out uh, the first row of the image where, um, where a certain percentage of the pixels are above the threshold. And that will be, um, yeah, that will be sort of uh, the, the minimum row that we, and then we do the same thing for the column, you know, a similar thing for the maximum row and the maximum column. Hopefully that was clear. That was probably not clear. I'm not really entirely sure of what I'm doing here either. I was just Googling and found out something that works. So a percentage that I took was 2%. So we find the first uh, the first row, I guess, that has 2% uh, of the pixel values above a certain threshold. So we first convert it to, uh, to gray, grayscale. And then we take out the images. Um, so we get a binary matrix of the, uh, the grayscale image that is about, above 0.1 times the mean of the, uh, the grayscale images that are not zero. So we basically take a mean over the pixel values that we know are not just black values. And then if it's above 10% of the mean value, then we get a, a one for that. Then we uh, take the sum of all the rows and we take the sum of all the columns. Then we get the rows where the rows of the sum is over um, a basic, basically a percentage and same thing for the columns. 
and then we take the minimum and the maximum of those. So we get the minimum row, minimum column, max row, max row and max column. And then we just crop the image that way. And then we uh, convert it back from array to image using pill. All right. So then we uh, also resize. And I stole this from, from some Stack Overflow post. And it worked. So and basically, uh, we want to resize, but we want to maintain the aspect ratio. So it's going to pad the image with black borders, depending you know, um, how, it's, uh, you know, how we need to do it to maintain the aspect ratio. So we have some old size. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what this does. I'm not going to try to explain this, to be honest. And then uh, we save uh, save a single image. So we first open it. We run it through the trim. We resize and maintain aspect ratio. And then we uh, finally, uh, I'm not really sure why we do this. I don't think we need to do that because we resize here. Yeah, I don't think we need to do this. Uh but yeah, okay, I'm going to remove this later on. But then we save that image. And then uh, for the final function, because we need to do multiprocessing. So that's why I'm separating into functions like this. So we call it fast image resize. Um, and yeah, basically we create jobs. Um, yeah, we're creating the information needed for all of these functions here. And then with pool, uh, we're doing this thing here. Why I did this is just so that I get TQDM. Um, as I said, I'm embarrassed to show this, but anyways. Uh, and then, yeah. So what we do is that we call fast image resize. We specify the folder, uh, the the old the folder with the images, and then we specify the new folder that we want to put it in, and we specify the output size. So what I want to do is maybe create two of them. One test image with resize 1000, and maybe one with... Uh, that we said 150. Um, and the reason why we want to have 150 is just fast to, to load. Um, so that's what we're using right now. So I'm going to use 150 and we're going to specify 150 here as well. 150. So later on, we might want to use larger image resolution. So that's why I'm doing one 1000 as well. And then one 150. Yeah. So this needs to be dot dot before because it's not in this actual... Um, folder location but now let's run this and let's see um and yeah i'll just show you when it's done all right just one small thing here uh i this needs to be a tuple all right so now it's finished finally and we got so the right was the images that we had previously so as you can see they yeah different proportions and aspect ratios and these are the processed ones so these are how they look like and yeah, I've taken a look at most of them or not most of them. There are 35,000, some of them, and they look uh, pretty good. So all we got to do now is just take this model that we had previously and just see if we improve the performance. If we change this right here uh, to pre-processed 150 and val uh, pre-processed. 150. So I resized, you know, uh, to 150 and then another to 1000. Uh, and so I expect, I expect that we're going to uh, train on larger image resolutions later. But for now, uh, we want to do this quickly. And so preprocess 150 is good enough. And then we have one uh, 1000 as well. Uh, for the test data set, we don't really care about that because all we're going to look at is our validation uh, set right now. So yeah. Anyways, let's now uh, run this again and see what we get if the if the performance is improved. All right, so I had to do one minor modification, which is to resize it to 130 by 130, and then take the uh, the crop the crop of 120 120. And I believe that is because uh, now when we're taking the random crop, it's going to be too zoomed in if we resize it to 150 150 because of the way we pre-process the images. Um, so I, I re-ran it with this and uh, we started with 0.55 and then we improved to 0.60. So this is something to write up. So we got, when we pre-process the images, we got a VAL score of, yeah, just 0.60. So that's a, you know, plus, 
uh, 0.05 uh, difference. And all right, so let's talk about what we can do now. So as I mentioned, we're using the cross entropy loss, which is not very suited for the metric that we're using because it doesn't take into account the 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 distance between the prediction and the label. And so one idea is to you um, improve the loss function. Now there are probably many ways to improve the loss function and perhaps there is a good proxy for this metric. Um, however, when I looked into it, it I wouldn't, wasn't able to find one that is actually differentiable, um, but there's probably some proxy. Uh, one thing we can do though, is just use mean squared error. Um, and that will be somewhat of a proxy because it will take the distance and it will actually square the distance. Um, and then uh, we will just convert to uh, integer predictions. So we'll take those floating values, that is the value between ze uh, zero and uh, let's say four, and then we'll just round them to sort of the, the nearest integer. Uh, that is one thing I'm thinking to improve. So maybe we can just do that uh, and we'll see uh, how much we improve it. So what we have to do is just replace the loss function cross entropy with MSE loss. And then uh, instead of using five different predictions, we're just gonna return one single con sort of a continuous value. And then if we go to the UTAS file, we have to change this thing right here. So we're no longer taking the argmax, right? Because we're not taking, uh, we're not using cross entropy. Instead, we're going to convert. Um, so we're going to convert. If the prediction is less than 0.5, let's convert it to zero. If it's between 0.5 and less than 1.5, we'll set it to one, et cetera. Um, one, two, three, four. And th so the fourth one is if it's greater than 3.5 and it, the prediction is less than 100. I mean, I guess you could set larger value here. Doesn't really matter. Um, but anything above uh, 3.5 really. Um, not sure why I even use this one, to be honest. But yeah, that's it for uh, the make prediction. And we have to do the same thing here for the check accuracy. So here we're getting our uh, predictions here. And here it should be all predictions.append and this should not be, this should not be used. And so that should be it. And hopefully we can run this now and uh, we should get some improvement. I just realized that we can't use the pre-train model now. Yeah, so I just realized that if we are going to do this, then we can't use the pre-train model. So maybe we can just set it to five there and then uh, load the checkpoint. And then after we load the checkpoint, let's change it to an nlinear uh, 5, 1536 and then one. So, uh, and then it should be fixed for the next, next saved model. All right, so let's run this and let's see what we get. Okay, so there were a few things that I showed incorrectly or just some, some minor tweaks. For example, we have to unsqueeze and convert them to float now with the new um, loss function. Then in the in the utils file, I, let's see. So here there were some uh, variable names that were incorrect, like this predictions was preds, I believe. Uh, and then also I had to do this dot view and to sort of make it into a vector because the dimensions didn't match and so on. Uh, and also for this uh, make prediction file, uh, I had to do dot squeeze here. Um, but just some very minor things, but just to make sure that everything is sort of there in the video. Um, and of course, everything will also be on GitHub. So now let me train this and let's see uh, what the result is. And it's done. Wow, this is starting to, I'm starting to realize this is taking some time to do. So I let it train a little bit more and uh, it get it got up to 0.65 and then it started decreasing now. So that that's where I'm gonna stop it. So the Val score is now 0.65, so plus 0.05 again with improving the loss function. I think you can do more here. As I said, I think you can get a better proxy for the metric we're using. Uh, but you know, I I'm happy with this improvement. So what are things more that we can do? Uh, and yeah, I so I have tried these before, so now I'm just kind of summarizing it to you um, because I it's taking a little bit too much time. 
So uh, w- the improvement or one thing to try is to uh, get a balanced data loader. So, uh, you know, I have made a separate video on this as well, where we can make each class uh, as common as the other, because uh, I haven't shown, shown, showed you this, but there's quite a class imbalance where uh, the zero class, no DR, is much more common than the others. Um, and so, and however, if you do a, get a balanced loader, that doesn't actually work. It actually uh, decreases the performance. And the reason for that is because it's going to overfit like crazy because, uh, you know, for one epoch, it's going to see the fourth class, for example, maybe 10 times more than the zero class. So this uh, doesn't doesn't work. Uh, you know, you can have ideas uh, that, you know, maybe you can, um, uh, you don't have to balance them completely, but make them a little bit more balanced. So maybe you could have class weights like, like, uh, like this or something, like you can double the importance of, uh, d- double the sampling rate of the first class, second and third and fourth and so on. But uh, yeah, that doesn't, didn't work either for me. So I'm just going to skip showing you uh, that part. Um, yeah, just to save some time. It didn't help. Maybe you can get it to work. Uh, but yeah, I didn't. So what are, what is an, another idea? So one huge part is to use heavy data augmentation. And then one other is to use sort of a blending so that we use left and right eye information. Um, and then increase image resolution. So those are the three things that we're going to try out. Um, but I'm going to do it one by one. So let's just take this first one, do it. Uh, first of all, so in the config file here, we're going to add some data augmentation. All right, there we go. Here is the new augmentation. So we're resizing it 130, random crop 120. Then we have horizontal and vertical flip. And we also have a random rotate 90 degrees. We have a blur, a, I'm not really sure what this is, but it, uh, it makes it, yeah, I'm not really sure what this is. And then we have color jitter. We also have coarse dropout, uh, coarse dropout, which makes sort of dark patches on some of the images. We have 12 different maximum hole and then max height and width is five because we have quite small image size. And maybe we can put this to six instead. And then we also have shearing with 35 degrees and that's it. So let's rerun this now with the new data augmentation and uh, see what we get. So it seems that adding data augmentation doesn't didn't actually help. Um, I'm not really sure how to wrap my mind around that, but it might be because of the image resolution for, um, yeah, I don't know really, but it, you know, it should help. Uh, it might just, it, it doesn't reduce it by much. Um, so 0.63 with data augmentation without, it got 0.65. Perhaps it's image resolution. Perhaps it, there's some of these augmentations here that are, that are bad. Um, I would bet in the image resolution. So I'm going to keep uh, the augmentation when we have larger image resolution. But uh, yeah, let's just write up. So this. So the next thing that we're going to do is add blending. So we're going to um, e- extract all the features uh, that we get from from the model uh, and then we're gonna save that to a CSV file and then we're gonna use that CSV file to train another um, small neural network and we're, we are there going to concatenate the two features for, for the images of the left and the right eye and then we're going to output one value for each but then it has information about both of the eyes which could be useful to make a better uh, prediction. So that is what we're going to do next. All right. So to to do this blend, uh, we first need to uh, to actually get the CSV file for the blend, where we uh, concatenate the features for both examples. So yeah, first of all, it's important to have shuffle equals false, just so that it goes into the right order. So it's left, right, left, right, uh, and then the batch size needs to be even, so that we have each in pair, and then yeah, have validation transformations on the train loader. 
uh, just so that it gets the best features for the examples uh, for the example model.eval and then file name first file name second labels first label second so we're going to have you know two for um, um, for for each and so you know the file name for left file name for the right and then yeah I could just have just as well named them left and right and then all features um, which is going to be the concatenation of the two then we iterate through the loader and we get images to the right device and then we do the uh, model that extract features of images and then we do an adaptive average pooling on that uh, then we reshape it so that yeah so the idea here is that we're running through an entire batch of maybe 20 examples uh, and then but it, it's actually you know 10 with with a pair of two for each so we're splitting it so that we have you know let's say we have 20 examples well reshape it so we have 10 comma 2 comma uh, in this case you know 15 36 for the feature shape uh, and then we do the same thing for prediction so we first extract the features and then we actually get the prediction from from the model and then we concatenate the two so remember the prediction is just one scalar value but at least we, we also have that prediction and then yeah we just flatten it with view and then get it to the cpu and numpy uh, add it to all features and then we get file name first uh, and there we got to use a stride of two and then the file name second uh, same but we start from position one and then with a stride of two uh, yeah same thing for the labels and then we concatenate all the features and we create a data frame for that where we data is all the features and the columns we're just gonna create f you know f for features so feature zero feature one feature two etc and yeah then we have um label first label second file first file second so we have the file names as well and then data frame to CSV. And then we toggle back to model.train. And then for the imports, we're going to need import torch functional uh, and warnings. And I think that's it. Now, this one, this file here is uh, training the blend. Now, this is very, very simple. So I don't want to go through this entire file. But just the basic imports that we've kind of been using so far. So what we have here is the make prediction file, uh, which is a minor modifications. And then we have... Uh, my I call it my data set from loading, uh, from reading from that CSV file that we create from this uh, get CSV for blend. So this is just a simple one from reading from that CSV. And then we have my model. And this is, uh, first of all, I have batch norm because uh, I'm lazy and I didn't want to normalize it. I don't know. This is, this is bad, but it works. So then we have 1536 for the features plus one for the actual prediction that we concatenated times two because we run both for left and right eye at the same time. Uh, then we do linear, same thing to 500 and then dropout, 500 to 100 and then lower value of dropout and then 100 to two because we're predicting the value for both of them at the same time. And then that's the model. And here we're doing you know, you know, basic stuff get the model to the device, create the data set, loader, do that for all of the validation and test set, and uh, then create the optimizer, learning rate 1e minus 4, 1e minus 4 weight decay, MSE loss, similarly as before, and that's it. This should be loader, and then maybe we can train it for five epochs. So what we have to do now is maybe here, we need to call that get CSV for blend function so that we obtain all of the CSV files that we need. So here we're going to do get CSV for blend from utils file. And then what I've added right here is just get CSV for blend where we send in the val loader model and then we create the output file, which is uh, I'm going to send them all to train directory and then val blend, test blend, train blend. All right, so let's run this code and get the CSV files. And good thing that I set all uh, this warning right here because it's important that we set this to false and then that we also set config transform to val transform. Um, and yeah, so let's rerun it. All right, so it's continuing right now, but maybe I can show you just uh, one of them. So the validation for the blend. So this is what it looks like. We have one row is uh, 
both examples where we have all the features going up to yeah, 3000 something. And then right here, we have the four last values is file second, file first, label second, label first. I don't know why I called it first, but left, right, left, right. Um, I guess I didn't know what order they were in. But then this is what it looks like. Yeah, so this is what's going to be used for our linear model uh, in the train blend function. And uh, yeah, we should hopefully see some improvement from this, right? Because you can imagine that there's information if if the right eye is is you know has diabetic retinopathy or for some degree, then maybe there's a correlation to the left eye, and we can use that information in in some way. All right, there we go. It's uh, done now, and uh, the training blend is six hundred megabytes, which should be fine. And then now we should be able to uh, run the train blend, and um, yeah, let's see how well it does. All right, so it, it did improve, uh, but I think it's a bit overfit perhaps. So, you know, you can see here that it gets 0.66 on the on the validation set. So yeah, we can write val score 0.66. So this is actually a plus 0.03 uh, because I used this this saved, uh, saved one from 0.63. So yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that. We are now going to try increased image resolution and see how much this helps. So uh, let's say 300 by 300. Maybe we can start with that. And uh, I'm actually going to use maybe let's do 330 and then 300. I think actually that uh, there should be better augmentation to use. I'm just very hesitant as to what to use. But either way, we're going to use, uh, yeah, this should maybe be 20 max height, max 20. And then color jitter, this should probably be good enough. And then here, 300, 300. And then let's retrain this. All right, so changing the image resolution to 300 by 300, uh, increased it quite a bit to 73.6. And that is from, you know, without the blending. So I think we could improve it uh, more also. So, but anyways, this is 0 0.70, yeah, I guess, 736. So that is plus from 0 .0, 0 0.65, that's 0 0.08 improvement. I'm thinking we can do resolution 500 by 500 and see what we get. All right, so for resolution 500 by 500, we get 0.787. So that's a plus 0.05 again. Uh, I think we just need one more of those, hopefully. So let's try and increase the image resolution even more. Maybe we can do 800, 800. And I don't know, uh, 728, perhaps. So 728, 728. And then let's retrain it again and see what we get. All right, so this is taking quite a bit of time now, uh, but uh, yeah, we're getting about 0. 0.8. I'm gonna run 1.818. Yeah, I'm so tired. 0. 0.818, 818. So that is plus, what is that? Plus 0. 0.03. So, you know, maybe that's enough. I'm really hoping it is. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do now is, uh, you know, may, pro probably we can train for a couple of epochs more and maybe get it even better. But if this is enough, then I'm happy with that. So I'm going to get the CSV for the different blends now. And then we'll see if we can um, use the information for both of them and uh, increase it so that we get top 1%. All right, so I just realized that I have forgotten to set the train transformations, and that probably explains, and also shuffle. All right, well, that sucks. All right, so I guess I'll train for one epoch more, 
and we'll see. So I trained it on uh, 728 by 728 and I reduced the learning rate to 1E minus 5 and that gave uh, 0.837 so that's a little bit of an increase. And then after training it on the blend uh, right here we got 85.4 on the validation data and then 88.7 on the training data. When I then uh, submitted this score we got 84.6 um, on Let's see, we got 84.6 public score and then 83.8 private score. So 84.6, 83.8. So 84.6 public, that would uh, be in the top five, which is top 1%. 83.8, that would also be, that would be top four. So yeah, we are now in the top 1%, which means I'm not going to continue iterate and try to improve it. Um, although I will share some ideas on how you can improve it. So I wrote, I wrote down some ideas. So first of all is to train on the validation data, right? That's 4,000 examples. Um, I could actually do that and it, perhaps just train the blend, uh, maybe for two or three epochs, uh, just that quick, uh, sort of that small neural network and try to see if we can get some improvement. Uh, a larger model, you know, we're using B3. Uh, maybe we could use B4, B5, B6, B7. Um, not really sure. But, you know, this takes time. But I think a larger model would probably help. Larger image resolution. So far, we've seen nice improvement from increasing, right? Uh, we've seen kind of a 0.05 increase from each image resolution increase. So... You know, maybe 800, 900 would tr uh, continue this trend, but at the increase of, you know, time, <laughs> which is, you know, these, this, these things take time. So then also one idea I had is to use better data augmentation method. I think the one I'm using now is far from optimal, um, but I think using something like Rand Augment would increase it, maybe 1% or 2%. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, ensemble for the blending model. I think we could just use varying uh, neural networks on small neural networks on top of these features that we've extracted and then do an ensemble uh, out of those. And I think that would probably increase it um, a bit. And I also think if you can use an ensemble of varying CNN models and then use all of those features as training data, uh, that would also probably help. Tweaking the hyperparameters. Um, yeah, this is difficult, but I think, yeah, I, you can always get some improvement from tweaking things. So tweaking the hyperparameters would probably help. Then a better loss function is another idea I have for a better proxy for weighted kappa than a mean squared error. But yeah, also if you have other ideas, uh, comment your ideas below. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.